Welcome to Animology, a podcast about language, the animal-related words and expressions we use every day, and how these words shape and reflect our relationship with animals. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. You can find me at ColleenPatrickGaudreau.com and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And be sure to subscribe to Animology at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're enjoying this free podcast called Animology, I just ask that you share it with others and leave ratings and reviews. Word of mouth is the best way to increase its listenership and supporting it is the best way to keep it going. Go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Gaudreau or Colleen Patrick Gaudreau.com to leave a tip in the jar. You can contribute monthly or make a one-time donation. Today's episode is Animals in Our Bones, Animal-Derived Anatomy Terms. By now, you would have listened to the early animology episode about the word muscle and how it came from the Latin word for little mouse, musculus, named such because the movement of a muscle is reminiscent of a little mouse moving under a blanket. I've also talked about another animology, coccyx, commonly called the tailbone, which is the small triangle-shaped bone at the base of the spinal column and named for its resemblance to the beak of a cuckoo bird. Coccyx comes from Greek for cuckoo bird. And in a former episode on the word tragedy, we talked about how a bit of our ear is called the tragus from the Greek word tragos, meaning goat. Having shared those with you thus far, I thought it would be fun to focus an entire episode on the number of terms for parts of our anatomy that have animals hiding within. Let's start with the cornea, the transparent membrane covering the surface of the eye. The word cornea comes from the Latin word cornu, meaning horn, because delicate though it seems, this tissue is surprisingly hard, like an animal's horn. Other words derived from Latin cornu are unicorn, meaning one horn, rhinoceros, meaning nose horned, rhino means nose, seros from horn, triceratops, meaning three horned, capricorn, meaning goat's horn, cornucopia, meaning the horn of plenty, and cornet, a type of musical horn, which was most likely originally made from animal horns. Another bit of our anatomy related to an animal's horn, even though it's more of an anomaly rather than a permanent part of our anatomy is corn, as in the thickened skin on your toe, for instance, that you can get from wearing shoes that are too tight. That thick, hard, sometimes pointy bit of skin is called a corn because of its resemblance to a thick, hard, pointy animal horn. Corn from cornu, meaning horn. But in addition to cornea and corn, we also have another anatomy term from the word horn, this time Greek, From the Greek word keras, K-E-R-A-S, which means horn, we get keratin, the tough protein that is the main structural component of hair and nails in humans and hooves, claws, feathers, beaks, and horns in other animals. The Greek word keras, K-E-R-A-S, and Latin cornu go back even further to the Proto-Indo-European root care, K-E-R, meaning horn or head or uppermost part of the body. And that's where the English word horn originates. It's also how English gets the word cranium, which is, of course, the skull, the bones that enclose the brain. Cranium derives from this Proto-Indo-European root cur, meaning horn, head, uppermost part of the body. So does cerebrum, top of the head, top part of the brain, cerebral, pertaining to that top part of the brain, cerebellum, which is diminutive of cerebrum, and cervix, pertaining to the neck or nape of the neck, and then applied to various neck-like structures of the body, especially that of the uterus. All of these words are rooted in the several thousand-year-old Proto-Indo-European root cur, meaning horn or head. Outside of anatomy terms, it's worth mentioning that same Proto-Indo-European root care, meaning horn, gives us the word carrot, which comes to English from Middle French, most likely named because a carrot is horn-shaped. The word corner, as in the point where converging lines, edges, or sides meet, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root care via cornu, meaning projecting point and horn. And of course, in previous episodes, I've already talked about deer, those wonderful ruminant animals who are members of the cervidae family. Cervidae, C-E-R, 
V I D A E, cervidae animals classified as such because of what were early on identified as horns, although we know them today as antlers. And I invite you to revisit previous episodes in which I also talk about the word heart, H A R T, an old English word for male deer, which also comes from the Proto Indo European root ker, meaning horn. For the same reason. Now, if you think you're going to have trouble remembering all of this, you're underestimating your hippocampus, the part of our cerebrum. Look at that, two animologies in one sentence, crucial for long term memory. The hippocampus was a Greek mythological sea creature who was part horse, hippo. Is Greek for horse and part fish, and who pulled Poseidon's chariot. An eminent Italian anatomist in the 16th century thought this area was suggestive of the curves of the hippocampus's tail, and so it was named. Hippocampus is also the genus of the fish known as the seahorse. And if you're paying attention, yes, the word hippopotamus is also an animology. Hippo is Greek for horse, potamo is Greek for river, and you have hippopotamus. It's a river horse. It's very poetic. You've also probably heard of a hippodrome. Hippodrome, the name of a famous entertainment venue, actually several famous entertainment venues or theaters, but which originally meant horse race course from hippodromos, Greek hippodromos, meaning chariot road or race course for chariots from hippos, meaning horse, and dromos, meaning course, hippodromos, hippodrome. Moving on to the ear, we have another animology, the cochlea. This spiral-shaped cavity of the inner ear is called such because it looks like a snail shell. Snail is cochleus in Greek. We also have concha, the largest and deepest concavity of the external ear, which comes directly from the Latin word for shell, concha. And of course, from that same root, we have the word conch, uh, any of various large spiral-shaped marine gastropod mollusks. Conch. Another somewhat related animal term for another part of the ear is the labyrinth. Somewhat related because it's once removed, but still... I'm going to consider it an animology. Remember in the Zodiac episode, I talked about the Minotaur, a half man, half bull mythological being from Greek myth, the word Tor, T-A-U-R being Greek for bull as in Taurus. Well, the Minotaur was confined and imprisoned in the labyrinth, the elaborate maze that only Theseus was able to escape once he killed the Minotaur. The labyrinth existed to imprison the Minotaur. That's why there was the labyrinth. Well, we call the network of passages with bony walls in the inner ear the labyrinth. That English word comes to us from Greek labyrinthos, and it's related to the Greek myth about the Minotaur who was imprisoned in the labyrinth. So I'm counting the labyrinth as one of our animologies related to our anatomy. Moving from the ear to the mouth, we have the name for a tooth that is the root, no pun intended, of much annoyance for every vegetarian. I'm talking about the cuspid, the tooth between the lateral incisor and the first premolar, the tooth that is more commonly called the canine. Canine gets its name from canis, Latin for dog, which in turn comes from the Greek word for dog, kynos. Kynos is also the foundation, by the way, of the word cynic and cynical and cynicism, which I mentioned in a Food for Thought podcast episode on political activism for animals. So you can hear more about cynicism, and I'll do an episode for animology specifically on that route. The reason I say this tooth And the word for this tooth is an annoyance for every vegetarian is because it's often what people point to to defend consuming animal-based meat. If we weren't meant to eat animals, why do we have canine teeth, people say? Well, first of all, teeth are not used only for eating flesh or even just for eating. Gorillas eat a lot of heavy twigs and bark, which requires really tough teeth, particularly molars, to grind all that tough plant material. But those incredibly long, sharp canines in mammals like gorillas, they're used also for display, in particular to defend against threats, as well as fend off other male gorillas competing for dominance. And they do a pretty good job at that. In fact, with the exception of humans, all primates have those really long canines 
but that doesn't make them flesh eaters. They're basically herbivores. And besides, with the exception of rabbits, rodents, and pikas, almost all mammals have canine teeth or cuspids. In fact, the largest canine teeth of any land mammal belong to the hippopotamus. Their teeth can measure upwards of 16 inches in length. These massive teeth are used for defense and combat, not for eating flesh. Hippopotamuses are true herbivores. So just because humans have what are called canines doesn't mean it predisposes us to eat animal flesh. And when you compare human canines to carnivores canines, ours are blunt and wide. Carnivorous canines are several inches in length, depending on the animal, uh, and razor sharp for tearing raw flesh. Ours would never be able to do that. They're not fangs. Now, the Greeks were indeed the first on record to note the tooth's superficial resemblance to the corresponding dog or canine tooth, and that's why it's named such. The word cusp comes from Latin cuspis, cuspis, meaning point, spear, pointed end. That's what the Greeks recognized in dogs and named our teeth the same thing, canines, and they come from cuspis. That's why we call them cuspids, because that meant point point, spear, pointed end. Most dentists and dental hygienists use both canine and cuspid, uh, probably more commonly using canine because it's more familiar to people. But among anatomists, the preferred term is cuspid. In fact, canine is not even listed in the Terminologia Anatomica, the international standard on human anatomic terminology. Staying in the mouth, we have another anatomy term that comes from animals. But first, a quick thank you to all of you for listening and for supporting this work. Your support makes all of it possible. Thank you so much to our platinum supporters, to our gold supporters, our silver supporters, everyone at every level. And remember, supporters at $10 and above receive written transcripts to every Food for Thought episode and every animology episode. So if you're getting anything out of either podcast or my work in general, please consider becoming a supporter. Today, visit patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau or just visit Colleen Patrick Goudreau.com and click on the donate button. Thank you so much. The buccinator is a thin, broad muscle forming the wall of the cheek. Well, both cheeks, because our face is symmetrical. So there are two buccinators, one on each side. If you purse your lips and blow... You'll notice these cheek muscles, the buccinators, become puffed out. The buccinator is also one of the muscles used for chewing, making it important in the process of eating. So it acts to press the cheeks and lips inward against the teeth so the food can be chewed up. So what does this have to do with an animal? Well, the word buccinator comes from Latin buccinator, trumpeter from Latin buccina, meaning horn or trumpet, from Latin Boss, B O S, meaning cow, plus canere, C A N E R E, meaning to sing or to play. And both of those Latin words, boss and canere, come from older Proto Indo European roots. If you remember from the episode Animal Characteristics in Word Histories, who they are in what we say, Proto Indo European con, K A N, meant to sing, and it's the root of the word hen and possibly cock, referring to a common characteristic of these male and female birds. So just as when you purse your lips and blow, your cheeks puff out, so too is the case for trumpet players when they blow into their instrument. Jazz legend Dizzy Gillespie was famous for his contributions to jazz and for the contortions his face made while playing the trumpet. If you just do a Google search for Dizzy Gillespie, Uh, You'll see images of his neck and cheeks puffing out so much. It looks like someone attached a bike pump to them. His cheek muscles especially are so flexible. Apparently, with repeated and heavy use, the mouth's buccinator muscles that line the cheeks can stretch. It's common enough that ballooning cheeks are sometimes called glass blower's disease on account of the occupational practice of forcing air through a metal pipe repeatedly. And that's what happens to trumpet players like Gillespie. They use their cheek muscles so much they become stretched. We'll continue to talk about words from boss, meaning cow or ox, such as bucolic, bugle, bull, bovine, buffalo, buckaroo, butter, even bulimia. So stay tuned for a future episode on all of those words and more. 
But for now, just remember that the buccinator muscles help us blow. And as a result, we can make a bellowing sound just like a cow. Moving down from our mouth, we have another bone shaped like a beak that gives us its name. Like coccyx, a triangle shaped bone, aka the tailbone, which is named after the beak of a cuckoo bird. The coracoid is a bone that extends from the scapula to or toward the sternum. And it comes from the Greek word koron, uh, K-O-R-O-N-E, meaning crow, plus O-I-D-E-S, meaning shape or form. The coracoid was named by Galen in the second century AD for its resemblance to the beak of a crow or a raven. Some people say it doesn't look like that at all, but that's where we get its name for its resemblance to uh, a corvid's beak. A corvid being the family of birds, the crows, ravens, and jays. And if I had to pick, I would say that this is my favorite family of birds. Not that I have to pick. You don't have to pick. But I love crows, and I love ravens, and I love jays. And I will be doing more episodes on expressions and words from crow and raven and jay. And we have so many. And of course, we already have the episode, Eating Crow, Try Humble Pie Instead. But many more are in the can. Moving on, we also have a few less scientific terms for parts of our anatomy inspired by animals. We have cowlick, dewlap, crow's feet, buck teeth, hair lip, goatee, ponytail, pigtails, spider veins, and an old slang term for the legs, gams. Gams is slang for legs. If you watch a lot of old movies like I do, especially film noir and detective films from the 30s, 40s, and even 50s, or even read the books from that time, the word gams is used not infrequently. Like in Mildred Pierce, uh, it was a film in 1940 with Joan Crawford, for which I believe she won an Oscar for her performance. It's a fantastic film if you haven't seen it. And it was based on the novel Mildred Pierce by the great James M. Kane. And here's a quick excerpt from Kane's novel. The gams, the gams, your face ain't news. It was a moment before Mildred quite knew what was meant, but then she gave her skirt a little hitch and wasn't exactly displeased when a photographer whistled. Mrs. Gessler, having no gams to speak of, stood behind her and the bulbs went off. Gam, in this sense, is actually much older than James M. Kane. It dates back to at least the 18th century and originally referred to the leg of either sex. But by the 30s, you see it being used mostly to refer to a woman's leg and an attractive one at that. There are two theories about the origin of gam, meaning leg. The shorter and more straightforward one simply traces it to the Italian word gamba, meaning leg. The other theory traces gam to the old word gam, G-A-M-B, meaning the representation of a leg of an animal on a coat of arms, which comes from the French gamba, uh, G-A-M-B-E, a close cousin of that Italian gamba. Interestingly, another form of gamba in French was jambe, uh, J-A-M-B-E, meaning leg, which gave us our modern English word jam, J-A-M-B as in door jam, the supporting side pieces of a door frame. The jams were named such because they serve as legs supporting the top of the door frame. Interestingly, there are two other older versions of the word gam that I thought were worth mentioning here. We don't use the word gam at all today, uh, but both of these older versions of the word gam, even older than the one I just gave you, both involve animals. One goes all the way back to about 1500, meaning large teeth or tusks, referring to that of whales, for instance. It was used only in the plural, gams, uh, and is of Scottish origin. It's pretty much archaic now, and the origin of this meaning of gam isn't certain, but it may be related to the Scots word gamp, meaning to eat greedily. The other meaning of gam, dating back to the mid-19th century, means a herd or school of whales, or by extension, a social meeting of whalers at sea. This gam is believed to be a regional dialectical variation of the word game, possibly drawn from the playful behavior of a group of whales. Another less scientific term for part of our leg 
but one that is most familiar to us is calf, as in the calf of your leg, the fleshy, muscular bulge on the upper back portion of your lower leg. It comes from an old Norse word, kalfi, and is related to the Irish Gaelic word kulpa. Etymologists aren't certain why we call this part of our anatomy the calf, but given the fact that calf as in the young of a bovine animal, dates back to 800, and calf, as in the fleshy part of our leg, dates to the 1300s, it's very likely that the bulge in our leg is named after the unborn calf of the domestic cow while he's still a bulge in his mother's abdomen. If you remember from our episode, Animal Characteristics in Word Histories, who they are in what we say, the word calf to refer to the young of a cow, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root, meaning to swell. So it's very likely that the bulge in the back of our leg uh, was reminiscent of calf, meaning the young in the cow's uh, belly. There are actually many, many other anatomy terms whose origins are animals, but they're mostly scientific terms that wouldn't be as familiar to lay folks unless you're in medical school. Uh, but if you'd like to hear more of these, let me know. If I hear from a lot of you, I'll devote another episode to more animal-related anatomy terms. In the meantime, take in all the ones we've covered here today. Coccyx, muscle, tragus, of course we heard them in other episodes, but cornea, corn, keratin cranium, cerebrum, cerebellum, cerebral, cervix, hippocampus, cochlea, concha, labyrinth, canine, buccinator, coracoid, cow lick, dewlap, crow's feet, buck teeth, hair lip, goatee, ponytail, pigtails, spider veins, gams, and calf. These and many more animal-related words reflect how deeply rooted animals are in our consciousness, in our history, in our lives, and deep in our animal bones. For the animals, thank you for listening to Animology, changing the way we talk and think about other animals. 